Menschen ist geil.
So one of the things that is difficult for me as a moderator is that sometimes the Department of Revenue Administration has a very clear view of how certain law articles need to be amended. Uh, I'm not an expert on all of that, um, but there may be times where I'll say, I believe that this would be a cause, would either nullify the uh, law article or cause it to be legally ineffective. Uh, and those amendments might be subject to after this meeting, uh, the legal counsel says it would have, you know, that would either nullify it or it would cause the uh, article to have legal effect. It might cause the uh, original war article to be the one that was placed on the ballot. Supervisors of the checklist are at the back of the auditorium. They also, I believe, have paper and pen if you want to make uh, amendments. Um, when I find the debate is over, um, I'll declare that the warrant article will be placed on the ballot and we'll move on to the next part. We won't be voting to place warrant articles on the ballot because by law, the, um, the warrant has been issued. Those articles will be on the ballot. It's just that some of them may get amended before they were placed on the ballot. Um, last uh, ground rule, and maybe the most important one, maybe I should have started here. Uh, Remember, you can overrule any rule that I make or any rule that I have as a moderator by a majority vote. Okay, you just say, so Bob, or Mr. Moderator, I move that the body claim that your last ruling is not effective, and I'll call it an immediate vote for you can proceed that way. Most importantly, I hope that you enjoy today's meeting and walk away from it with your time that is well spent. Please remember that we don't always have to agree about the article or amendment. Um, but as we discuss and debate articles and amendments, uh, let's remember that uh, we're all neighbors and hopefully the neighbors will continue to live together in this community. We're serving together often as unpaid volunteers uh, or fully paid volunteers in some instances uh, for the work that we're doing. It doesn't mean that we don't express our disagreements openly and fully, um, but it does mean that we try to preserve some boundaries of respect, mutual respect and civility. Um, any questions? That we move to Article 1. Uh, Article 1, there's no discussion to be had. The nominations are closed by state statute, and Article 1, which calls us to bring in ballots for select board member and overseer of the board for three years, one the treasurer for one year, one chief of the fire department for one year, three members of the budget committee for three years, one trustee of the trust fund for three years, one trustee of the library trust for three years, and one trustee of the cemetery trust for three years will be placed on the ballot. Article 2, the zoning ordinance amendment number one. Article 2 states, are you in favor of the amendment to the zoning ordinance as proposed by the planning board? to add a definition for junkyards in section 826 regulated junkyards recommended by the planning board, majority vote required. I'll ask Ms. Kendall to introduce the article to us. Good morning. All, all the, can you hear me? Board of order. Can we have to put it on the floor? No. No, it's, uh, it's, this is a deliberative session and it's coming before the body uh, because it's on the warrant. And we must discuss it. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. All, all of the zoning ordinance, ordinance amendments that are on the There are a few. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Are on the yellow handout at the back of the table. It is a double sided sheet. It has the full language. It's, a, it's an addition. This, this article is to add a complete new section to the zoning ordinance which would speak to junkyards. Currently there is nothing in the ordinance regarding junkyards except, except for the okay. Currently, the only thing in the zoning ordinance referencing junkyards is that they are a non-conforming use. We do have one junkyard in town. Uh, it is best to handle. We have been advised that it is best to handle junkyards through an ordinance rather than putting every regulatory um, item in the annual business license of any junkyard. So. 
This is the planning board's um, attempt to define how any junkyard should operate within the town of Rollins. Thank you. Uh, we are in discussion on Orange Article 2. We can discuss and debate it. It uh, appears to me that state laws require, or require that the article as proposed by the county board be placed on the ballot. Uh, so I do not intend to accept any amendments, but we can discuss and debate more about it. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Martin. Um, I live next door to the uh, junkyard and have a very vested interest in, in how that uh, business operates. Uh, I'm very much in favor of the ordinance. I think that's a very constructive step. Um, I have submitted written comments to the yeah, just last night to the board and the board for. Uh, Consideration. The uh, primary thing I wanted to comment on is everybody on Somersworth Road, that area, is on well water. Uh, and we're all have had our water tested by the state because of past contaminants in this area. So I think it's very important that um, the regulation uh, addresses spill prevention, making sure that um, that the business that operates there is not contaminating groundwater underneath the junkyard. It's a very large aquifer uh, that covers that whole area um, and it's a source of low water for a lot of people and we don't want to see that contaminated with gas and oil and other uh, byproducts that are uh, part of the junkyard. I'm not opposed to the business, uh, but I, I do believe it needs to be run very, very well. It's a very valuable asset for the town. We have a you know, basically inexhaustible water supply there. And uh, we should, I recommend supporting the ordinance um, and, and provide a specific comments. But I, I think it's the main thing is we've got to protect the groundwater because that's what most of the neighbors are worried about. Thank you, Mr. Arby. Is there a further comment or discussion on the article? None more article two. Uh, the debate is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article three is zoning amendment number two. Um, that article reads, are you in favor of the amendment to the zoning ordinance as proposed by the court in order to amend section 13.1 paragraph one deleting painting from activities requiring a building permit and increasing the value of activity requiring a building permit to $2,500? recommended by the planning board and the majority vote is required. So to spec up, I'll ask Ms. Kendall to present the warrant article 3. Thank you. This article is proposed because we believe that the, the building permit provision of the zoning ordinance is um, very restrictive. With, um, in other words, almost anything that one might do to one's home requires a building permit. So, this is an attempt to be a little bit more um, in aligned with other communities in the kinds of things that might require a building permit. So currently, the limit of activity that one can do without requiring a building permit is $1,500. So with the inflation of the cost of repairs over time, it seems a little bit more reasonable to raise that limit to $2,500. Um, the other thing to consider about this article is that building permit fees uh, offset um, operations. So it, it will be, you know, some small reduction of income as a result of this amendment. And also the building permits are used to affect assessing. When one gets, an, when one gets a building permit, it flags assessing to go out and look at the property and verify the work that has been done to make sure that taxation is equitable, that everybody is really being taxed on what their property, um, the state of what their property really is. So, um, just for the thought. Thank you, and we're moving into discussion on one of our three. Um, Chief Dushar, would you do me the kind favor of checking in with Mr. Hartford down in the staff room? See if we can do something to get that mic working back. Thank you so much.
We're in discussion on Warrant Article 3. Discussion and debate on Warrant Article 3. I find that the debate on Article 3 is open and Article will be placed on the ballot. Article 4 is Zoning Ordinance Amendment Number 3. It reads, are you in favor of the amendment to the zoning ordinance proposed to, by the planning board to add a definition to a butter to reflect the state's definition as set forth in RSA 672.3 general provisions, words, and phrases recommended by the planning board, majority vote required? Um, Ms. Kendall will introduce warrant article 4. Thank you. The purpose of this article is to clarify the definition of a butter for um, across zoning and when people want to change their property in certain ways, such as subdivisions and lot line adjustments, they are required to notify people who surround their property. Those are the abutters. But what that means is different for planning than for zoning. So we are trying to make that more consistent, but also to not have to monitor that definition so much and just have it reflect whatever the current state law is about the butter. Thank you. Discussion and debate on Warrant Article 4. Seeing none, I find that the debate on Warrant Article 4 is over the article to be placed on the ballot. Zoning Ordinance Amendment Number 4 is Article Number 5. Article 5 reads, are you in favor of the amendment to the Zoning Ordinance as proposed by the planning board to revise Section 11.3.2.1, deleting the phrase, quote, by the planning board, close quote, thereby allowing applicants to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for a special exception to be heard directly by the ZBA without first going to the planning board. Recommended by the planning board, majority vote is required, and I'll ask Ms. Kendall to introduce the article to us. Sometimes, so if, if somebody wants to propose a new use on a lot that is non-conforming, which includes building on a lot which has never been built before, they need a special exception with the zoning ordinance, uh, with the zoning board of appeals. Our zoning ordinance currently reads that they are first required to go to the planning board and have the planning board weigh in that the proposed use is appropriate for that site. So the purpose of this amendment is to do a few things. It, first, to streamline the process for applicants that they can go directly to the zoning board since the planning board is really only weighing in on whether or not it's appropriate. They feel as though the Zoning Board of Appeals can weigh in on that. Also, we've had a couple of cases of this in the past whereby applicants will use that determination of the planning board to promote their project in a way that the planning board did not intend. It is not meant to say that the planning board really favors the project in any way. It's just a required part of the process. So, so there's that. And then to make our process more aligned with what other communities require because people are um, subject to more process which is more expense than they're required to go through in other communities. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. Discussion and debate on Warrant Article 5. Seeing none, uh, more, I find that the debate is over on Article 5 and it will be placed on the ballot. Article 6. It's a transfer station ordinance amendment. It reads, are you in favor of the amendment to the transfer station ordinance as proposed by the select board, which updates language to reflect current operations and delegates decision making for transfer station sticker appeals to the town administrator, recommended by the select board majority vote required. Ms. Kendall will introduce this article to us. Thank you. Uh, a copy of the full ordinance is on the back table for your review, and I just want to also let you know that any of the handouts on the back table that were provided by the town, not all of them were provided by the town, they're all available now through the website. There's a link for 2019 town report materials. It is mostly complete. We are working with some departments, but um, those materials anyway are available there. You'll notice that it's, it's red lines throughout. It's not a specific... Um, there's not one thing particularly about it, but the intent was to re update the language entirely. Um, it makes reference to the selectmen as opposed to the select board that we can refer to the, um, our governing body as. It refers to operations that are no longer in place, such as burning trash. Um, so, so it's just to clarify how we currently operate now, including the breaking out of recycling. 
but it also does provide one more piece of functionality, which is that it delegates the authority to, it, it clarifies that um, only residents will get transfer station stickers, whereas the current version of the ordinance says that property owners are also entitled to some um, access to the transfer station. So under this amendment, um, the authority to grant the appeals for people, sometimes people have cars that are not registered in town, but they do live in town because perhaps they have a, uh, a home business that's maybe registered in another community. There are occasions when people ask for exceptions to this policy that the um, sticker be only given to vehicles that are registered in the town, at, you know, as a way to enforce the residency requirement for stickers. So it does add that that um, you know, the town administrator would um, be the person to make those decisions, which, as much as it um, frees the board up somewhat from those decisions, it's also a convenience to those people. Um, now that the select board is meeting every other week. Um, people are aggrieved when they are denied or delayed in their requests for trash disposal. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. Uh, this meeting may discuss the debate in the New York. Slightly moved to 436 Washington Street. Is there guidelines laid out for the town administrator by the select board on? Um, cases or are they reviewed at all if the town administrator is not? Question for the moderator about guidelines established by the select board before the granting of the agents. There are not currently any written guidelines. I make those decisions based on what I understand the will of the select board to be at the time um, because of recent cases that they have heard recently and um, the granting of those decisions, I have a, a good sense of what those um, granted appeals would be, which are that um, people who have um, business vehicles that they use as their also primary residential vehicle because maybe their company provides a vehicle so they don't otherwise have a vehicle, or otherwise um, property owners who are not personally able to go to the transfer station um, but have family members with outside registrations who are able to go for them. Good morning, my name is Wendy Chase, um, 20, uh, on, I think, 12 Short Street, and I'm also a your state representative. I wanted to just ask on the big, um, you may receive a short term pass, which I know there were some questions about that. With, not be able to have a, a, a pass given to you if you do not actually have the property. Anyway, my question is, how? what is the short-term pass? How long does it last? Are you able to use the dump just as everybody else would with things that are being left there for waste? Question to the moderator. Do you have about uh, short-term passes? The, the, intent, the intent of that provision is also not in writing, to be clear, um, to allow the select board the flexibility to um, determine what they would feel is appropriate. Currently, um, it's, it's meant to alleviate the problem of landlords, property owners in town, who might have debris left over when their apartments are vacated. Um, they would be subject to Sorry. Okay. They would be subject to the same um, fee structure that any resident would be subject to um, if they're disposing of bulky items. Um, it would be the, the goal is to have a one day pass for a specific one day that they intend to go. Um, I can't say that it would always be that because you know it, it depends on the circumstances. But it would be I would say not more than a week. Further discussion and debate on Warrant Article 6. Seeing none, I find that the debate on Warrant Article 6 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article 7 relates to elderly exemption qualification benefits. It's by petition. It states, to see if the town will vote to modify the Rollinsburg elderly exemption limits as follows. 
elderly exemption from age category 65 to 74 years of age increase from 50,000 to 90,000, 75 to 79 years of age increase from 75,000 to 110,000, 80 plus years of age increase from 100,000 to 130,000, income limits, single married asset limits increase from 32,000 to 45,000, increase from 36,000 to 50,000. Uh, I hope I'm reading this properly. Single increase from 100,000 to 180,000. Married increase from 100,000 to 180,000. Uh, it's not recommended by the select board. Uh, it's presented as a petition that I've asked from Ms. St. Hilaire, who is one of the petitioners, uh, to introduce Article 7 and provide a brief overview for us. And if you have any trouble with that right now, Who had extra money? 
you know, it was, it was a poor area. So they didn't have the ability to plan for this retirement. We did. We, and so coming forward, are we going to have a bunch of people who are applying for this? Not that. Really not that. Because most of us have all of these pensions. Um, these folks don't. So there's a handout in the back that lists the current exemption limits um, in the Stratford County area and a little bit of Rockingham County since they're so close. And you can see that they range pretty widely. Um, some, some towns are more generous than others. Um, the numbers, these numbers that you see, are based on Madbury, which is about the same size as us. Same population, same valuation. There, so I, I, I put a hand up in the back of the room that um, kind of describes the reason I got this petition as well as the limits. Um, I hope everybody has a chance to look at that um, prior to um, close out this article. I'd like to kind of open up for questions if I can have a look at questions directed to me. So we're in a discussion and debate on Warren Article 7. Uh, this meeting may discuss debate and then we have So I live local Washington Street. So from what I understand is that there'd be a loss of revenue of one to two million dollars if everybody well <coughs> from one point three to two point nine. Since we're, okay, yeah. um, so, we would, based on the current applicants, it would add $290,000. So it would bring us to about 1.6. So it would be about a difference of 2.9,000. Okay. Um, our, what other exemptions does the town have, and what public um, assistance do the elderly have access to in the community? I think Ms. Kendall has a response to that question, although um, Ms. Taylor, if you want to respond, to this I, I just want to clarify that it's it's not a loss of revenue so much as that it's a loss of taxable property that you can divide the appropriations by. So in other words, the town is going to raise as much money as the town is going to raise, um, and, and it will. It always divides that by the taxable property in order to determine the tax rate. So when you decrease the value of the taxable property, the for the same amount of money that you have to raise, the tax rate will go up. So the, the town will always get what it needs, but the tax rate, any any decrease in valuation will result in an increase of property taxes. So I just wanted to say that. Um, there are a number of programs for the elderly that somebody could um, come into the office and talk about that I am aware of um, through social service agencies. Um, other than that, um, the town does have, um, there are other um, tax credits and exemptions. Um, veterans who have served 90 days during a certain period of time qualify for a $500 reduction from their tax bill. Um, if they are completely disabled, then I think it's $1,400 um, unless they are um, completely disabled and a home is built by the VA, in which case their property is not taxable at all. Um, in addition to that, nonprofits, if they file their form annually as required, those the value of those properties is not taxable. Um, but there are qualifications um, for the nonprofits, um, and then I, I believe that's all. So you also wish to respond. Um, one, one of the other things that I noticed that was on part of my research for this is um, that we forgive Garrison players um, four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars a year for their property. So. I don't understand why two hundred ninety thousand dollars for a resident is an issue when we can give four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars to a business. Um, I also heard that elderly live on a fixed income of roughly thirty-two thousand dollars a year. Um, 
or that they have a fixed income. I am an employee, I have been for many years, and my income was less than what you quoted. So I would argue that it's a hardship on everybody. When I'm making twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a year working as a one-on-one -on -one in the school system, um, you just saw the news that Dover's paraprofessionals asked for a raise because they're not making the living wage. So it's not just the elderly. So, so Ms. Leopold, I'm going to ask you. It looks like you're done. But please address the Warren article rather than uh, a, an individual petition. Thank you. Um, Michelle Small, 631 Main Street. I was interested in when the last time this um, exemption was in place. Question through the moderator to, I guess, Ms. Kendall about uh, the status of the uh, exemption when it was last changed. So, before I answer that question, I, I just want to say that the, the loss of taxable property may be 290000 for those who are currently receiving the exemption. The reason the Select Board did not recommend this petition article is because it's not knowable how many additional people would qualify for it when you raise the income level by anything, let alone by that much. Um, and because while we are in one of the oldest states, um, our median age is a couple of years older here in Rollinsburg than it is for um, the rest of the state. Um, that being said, nobody that I've ever spoken to has any recollection of whether um, or when these amounts were ever evaluated. Um, a follow-up question is when were the original amounts um, created? Question to the moderator about when the original exemption was established. Also, also not known, but um, I will say that typically we send out a voter guide addendum after this meeting, so I will try to look into that and see if we can, um, the Department of Revenue likely has more information about when it was adopted and whether or not it was ever changed, so um, we'll try to get more information to you about it that way. And then just a comment that I think it's a responsible article, um, I often felt um, when I hear that we have a large elderly population um, that uh, those people, if you're living on you know, $50,000 or $45,000, should have some exemption to keep them in the town. I think it's a valid point that they, they require minimal services versus um, you know, the younger population. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Moderator. I have a proposed amendment to this one article. I'm Greg Hansen from 11 Watson Lane. Delete 180,000 and replace it with 100,100. 
100, and then the asset limits for, for married category as follows. Delete 180,000 and replace it with 100,100. We're in discussion and debate on the proposed amendment. It's been moved and seconded. Ms. Hanks, I understand you'd like to address it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Basically, the Warren article that has been proposed originally for your consideration asks for this income as it allows if the person qualified for your elderly exemption to be raised and the bottom of the property exempted to be increased. What does this mean? The idea of the elderly exemption is to prevent seniors as over 65 from being forced from their homes by property taxes that exceed their reasonable ability to pay. The law provides that the exemption applies only to one's home. The asset allowance considers only those assets other than the senior's home. The area has 259 municipalities consisting of towns, cities, and unorganized places. A review of the information from the New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration reveals that currently Rollinsburg is one of 62 municipalities in New Hampshire with an income guideline allowance of 32,000 or above for single persons to qualify, one of 88 municipalities with an income allowance of 36,000 or more for married persons to qualify. In addition, Rollinsburg is currently one of only 63 municipalities with an asset allowance of 100,000 or higher for elderly who are either single or married. Again, asset allowances do not include the value of your home. Rollinsburg presently exempts the first 50,000 of the value of the home for qualifying seniors aged 65 to 74, 75,000 for those aged 75 to 79, and 100,000 for those aged 80 or older. This Warren article increases the elderly exemption by 180 percent in the 65 to 74 year age bracket, the bracket most likely to grow in the next few years. Presently, Rollinsford income allowances and for single persons and the asset allowances for both married and single persons put Rollinsford in the top 25 percentile, meaning that 75 percent of the cities, towns, and unincorporated communities have lower allowances than we do here in Rollinsford. The proposed Warren article is written, contains income and asset allowances and exemptions that will put Rollinsford in the top 1 percent, meaning 99 percent of all 259 cities, towns, and unorganized areas in New Hampshire would have lower values of property exempted and lower income and asset allowances for qualification. The amount of the elderly exemption and qualifying allowances of income and assets work together. At this time, there are 13 residents that are claiming the elderly exemption, and that is eliminating a total of approximately 1.25 million in property value from our tax rolls. Should we adopt the more article as proposed and increase the elderly exemptions only for those 13 persons, we'll be removing another 380,000 in property value from the rolls. With higher income and asset allowances, more people will qualify for the exemption. Today, 23% of all street residents are age 60 or older. Another 20% are in the 50 to 60 age bracket. As we age, should the income now asset allowances be relaxed, the numbers of persons qualifying will increase. In the handout provided, which is at the back of the room, I put one in, I explain what could happen should the warrant article pass. Should we remove over 10 million in value from our tax rolls, median taxes would rise over 200 a year using the current median home prices valued by Zillow. Rather than raising the eligibility levels while simultaneously raising the value of property exempted, we should consider raising only the value of the property exempted. We realize property values may increase faster than the fixed incomes of our retired residents. We should have a more in-depth discussion of what steps can be taken to best protect our elderly while taking into consideration all stakeholders. Perhaps we can work with the select board in developing appropriate guidelines to accomplish this. However, raising the income and asset allowances and raising the value of the public exemption will remove more property from the tax rolls and will result in an even greater tax burden for the remaining taxpayers, inordinately affecting the younger population. This will make Rollinsburg a less desirable place for families to reside and may result in a loss of population and eventually force the town to raise taxes. While we all want to help those of our aging population, we cannot do so at a price the rest of our community cannot afford. Thank you. Great. 
discussion and debate on a proposed amendment. Same thing for the I understand what Ms. Ms. Hansen was saying um, about the concern. But I, again, I have to remind people and, and ask people who here expects to be living on $32,000 a year in the future? How many people don't have 401ks and are planning to live above that? So when we talk about who is going to be lining up for this credit, I think that you're inspiring a fear factor here that doesn't really exist. So, think, think about where you're going to be when you're 60. And think about how many people are left in this town um, and are collecting this, this credit. The annual report tells me there are nine. If it, if, it was a, if it was a number that was higher, maybe if you want to more in, but think about us. We're the next generation. Okay. So I'm just saying, Laura, I'll hold this until we're ready for the vote. We have a request for a secret ballot, and I'll go through that when we get to the meeting. My name is Robert Egan, 457 Locust Street. I find it appalling that we've got these elderly here in town can't get a tax credit while they're paying for a large staff and in large salaries for our town employees, particularly in the town hall. I find it hard to believe that we can't come up with money while we're giving almost a half a million dollars to the playhouse and we can't give some of these breaks to the elderly here in town. And I find it amazing that we are one of the highest spending school salaries and school costs, but somehow we can't find anything in it at this moment. This plan is originally put up, should be taken and looked at seriously by the players. Amendments to cut that should not be put. Suzanne here. So, um, I don't support the part of seven as originally written, but I do really support the amendment. And I'll, I'll tell you why. It's essentially, I think, to understand the amendment really pretty much leaves things as is. So, what I do support is a careful analysis of our exemptions, looking at our population, looking at surrounding areas. And my understanding is that the petitioners do not speak to the select board. Now, I think what I would like to see is the select board to uh, work on this over the coming year so that we have some idea, not guesses, not oh, I think, but a better understanding of what, uh, what it means to really increase these exemptions. Because if Whatever, whatever is taken out of that base, as I think our town administrator said, is going to be paid by the rest of us. And I don't know if it's set to a generic elderly or not. I don't know. I don't feel elderly. There you go. Um, so I, I support looking at this thing. I think it should be looked at. I don't support just having something where we really don't know what the effect of this is. And it could be serious for because those expenses are going to be uh, pushed back over everyone else. And while I, I'm not ungenerous in nature, I just want to know. I want to have a better idea. That's my point. I really want to have a better idea of what this would cost or what something else that doesn't have the same impact would cost. So maybe there's something that's not quite this, but does increase where the current exemptions are. And I think I'd like this, what I'd rather see is have a select board work with the petitioners and other folks interested uh, over the coming year to come up with, with a um, and a change to the element extensions that where we have a better understanding of what it would cost all of us. Thank you, Ms. Hewitt. We're in discussion on the proposed amendment to Article 7. Charles Cooper, one door in the uh, Maybe we ought to take a look at the criteria we set, which are age criteria. I'm 68 years old and I'm still working. Social Security Administration gives everyone an extra 7.5% they work further into their elderly years, if you want to put it that 
that way, the 70. Currently, right now, if you look at statistics, most people take their Social Security at 62. But they're taking their Social Security when they get less and then they don't earn more. So why would we set the criteria of 65 years old when someone can work till 60 and they can gain an extra four years at 8% or well, 7.5%, they, they say age but for 7.5%. It just doesn't seem right to me when people can work further that we're allowing them to retire and take this exemption, which again goes on the burden of the rest of the population. It just, to me, if we go to adjust the dates, the age dates, Thank you, Mr. So, I have a couple of questions that I hope the town can answer. Um, what is the current uh, age range? Is it the same as being proposed or different on the LTV exceptions? And what is the typical how long does the typical exemption last? Does it end upon death or can it be extended if there's a So, Ms. Lee, for we're in discussion and debate on a proposed amendment to the warrant article, I'm going to rule those questions out of order this time. Once we vote it on the amendment, we'll come back and we can, we can address questions about the effect of the warrant article. So, I just have one comment. I, this fall, ran a senior coffee hour for the senior citizens of the community at the town library. And this was not something that was mentioned as a desire of the dozen to two dozen people who showed up today. Instead, what was expressed was the desire for the community to teach the seniors how to access this. We're in discussion and debate on a proposed amendment to one article seven. Uh, Judy Nelson, on uh, my order Lane. I am um, interested in, in, in both the original and, and the amendment in, in the fact that it brings something to the attention of the town that I think is very important. That we, since we cannot seem to remember when the exemption even started, or, and, and that it probably hasn't changed since it started, that it is a very good idea to look at it, uh, to look at what it should be. But I believe it should be a more, uh, more a practical approach that would take the time to do it, get the right research, do what is right for the entire town, including the other one, uh, what, what would best serve them. So I would, it, it, with the two choices before me, I would prefer the amendment um, in, in this case, so that we can take the time to look at it, and then, and then to direct the select board to please continue the amendment. Thank you. The missed same layer as you approach, keep coming. Um, I want to thank both of you, both of you. Um, the, the, there was a very nice exchange back there where you were deferring to each other about who would go first. I appreciate that. Go ahead.
I think we all have to be interested in protecting our elders, and we also want to be protecting everyone in the town. We should have a, a whole vibrant community, and I believe that if we look at this in the right way, we can come up with the right answers for this and try to protect our elderly and have a vibrant community that is attractive to all of Thank you. Thank you very much. Looks like we're almost ready for a vote on the email. We'll see you later. We'll see you later. We'll see you later. So I, I understand um, Ms. Victoria and Ms. Nelson's desire to investigate it and research it, but I just have to say, I spent years on the budget committee asking for evaluation of fire department salaries, asking about performance reviews, and just like those things, I just feel this will get kicked, I can't let it kick out of on this, just like they have on those other committees. Um, I don't think it would be a priority for them. In the same way that having performance reviews for employees has been a um, priority, you know, telling us how firefighters are paid is a priority, so that's just kicking the can out of it. The data is, is available on the table. The set the ranges in the area are there for people to look at. Um, so to Ms. Um, Nelson's point, how does the school help our elderly? You know, there's discussion about you know helping everybody, but what have they done for the elderly except increase their property tax for services they don't use? And then in terms of evaluating this, how are we going to evaluate this? Say we don't do any more of this. How are we going to evaluate this? Are we going to send out surveys to our residents, asking them what their retirement plan is and how much they plan to live on? There's no way to do this. It's a roll of the dice. You have to kind of use your judgment about the direction our generations are going in and their retirement plan. We all know how that works. And, um, I would say also just my um, research came from our annual report. So all of the data is in the annual report. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coons. Uh, Tom Coons, Stockdale Circle. You know what? I look at this and see in 10 years, believe it or not, in 10 years I'm going to be eligible for one of these things. Um, you know, you mentioned the school, and I think all of us who pay tax, my parents, where they live, they haven't had kids in school in <coughs> almost four years. They pay an exorbitant amount in property tax, but having the school here, I'm sure, is for new residents who come into town with kids. Uh, it's a great thing. It's a value. It's a selling point. The other thing is that you guys might remember last year there was a petition to look into sending sixth graders to Marshwood. And it was a petition asking us to explore it. This would have been a perfect opportunity to do the same thing. We had Forum. We had people coming in to, to discuss it. We had uh, educators that answered questions. I think you were at the forum. Um, Again, Mr. Coons, I'll ask you to you're address right, the amendment and not the I mean, Mr. Moderator. Sorry. Uh, but my point is, this would have been a great opportunity to have a petition for the town as a whole to explore this. Some of the, the some of the comments and questions today, I think, would have been answered. Uh, a little more research. Um, I, I just think that would have been a better approach. What concerns me is the, the numbers seem to be fluid. Um, what the actual impact would be. Because every year, you're going to have more and more people that are falling into that category. So it just seems like there's no real Find number of how that is going to impact all of those folks who live in town, who are moving into town. Um, but I'm all for uh, exploring this and having you know, further discussion. I just think that that would be a better approach, really getting everybody involved. So, and I am in support of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm about ready to call the vote on the proposed amendment. I'm going to try to summarize it to make it easier for you to know what a yes vote means, but Ms. Hilaire and Ms. Hansen, please listen closely. If you think I haven't summarized it fairly, let me know. The proposed amendment would uh, restore it, a, a yes vote on the proposed amendment would essentially restore the current levels on the exemption, both at the property exemption and the income limits, uh, and a no vote would be to leave Article 7 as it was published in your uh, vote back. Is that correct? A no vote on the amendment would leave it as it's in the vote back. Right? In the, in the warrant. As I understand it, Ms. Hansen increased all of those limits by $100. Okay. Yes. It would increase the existing limits by $100. A no vote would, would um, leave the Warrant Article 7 as published in the warrant. As you read it here. Yes. So a no vote adopts this. Right. No. No. A no vote rejects the amendment and leaves the article as it yes. was published. Yes. Sounds yes. So just to be clear then, a yes vote then makes a further vote on, on, on what is being presented here on um, no vote. No, no, we will not have a vote on that. We are not voting on Article 7 today. All voters of the town of Rollinsburg will get a chance to vote on more Article 7 at the polls in March. Right, let, let me re restate my question. If the amendment passes, it is the amendment that will appear on the moment. Correct. We understand what we're voting for. I know this was a, a major amendment. Okay. Uh, with that, um, we are, I have received a request for a secret ballot on the proposed amendment to order Article 7. I verified that the, uh, the five people who signed it are present in the room and that they're voters. Uh, so we will have a secret ballot. We can line up by the uh, supervisor's table. Uh, there are pre printed um, ballots, and you can just circle your uh, response and deposit it in the uh, ballot box. I previously checked the ballot box to make sure it was empty. Uh, yes, we have three need times, and I'll get those while we
Mr. Gallagher, you're welcome to use either this mic or the other mic. Jim Gallagher, 46 Mitchell Road, Ronald to the Mansion. Good morning, uh, As you know, the sports book Reading was passed in the state of New Hampshire, and, and now it is up to individual municipalities to uh, make a decision whether or not they'll allow it. And we have had a business come to the town to petition for sports book credit, and that's the bowling alley, you go call. I'm here. Uh, I was one of over 25 people who signed the petition, and the reason I signed it is as follows. Um, Dover Bowl has uh, been a significant revenue generator for years and years to local nonprofits, and nonprofits that really make a difference. Uh, my friend's place, uh, where they provide you know housing for people. Um, the Triangle Club, which my wife Sandra is the board chair and um, has worked hard on, uh, it represents over sixty thousand dollars a year to their budget. Think about this: fifty-five meetings a week, hundreds upon hundreds of people go to these facilities, go to the Triangle Club for Harlan's anonymous meeting uh, meetings in AA. It's often referred to as the other emergency room in Dover. So when we look at uh, Dover Bowl and, and wanting to do this, what comes to my mind is continuing to support this business so they can in turn continue to support the many charities that they, they now do in Dover, and not only in Dover, but in the surrounding area. Um, this money, as you know, a portion of it goes to education. This education funding comes back to communities like ours and, and, and I've heard people come up here today and talk about the sixth grade and going to Marshall and the deliberations about education. And I've listened to it over the years and chatting with uh, uh, the school board and both members uh, of the uh, selectmen and select persons, excuse me. Uh, and so I think when we can help a local business that pays taxes to our community, do better for themselves, and in the process give money back to the community, it's really an no brainer. So, that's why I'm here. That's why I signed the petition. That's why I am very supportive, along with my wife and many, many other people. And I hope who, my wife couldn't be here today. She apologizes for that. Uh, and I hope you will consider favorably on this, and that people will be supportive when it comes to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Talbot. For a discussion and debate on Warren Article Eight, uh, it can be we can discuss debate and then the in town are eligible sites for sports booking and does the state um, commission that oversees this have specific guidelines for Okay, so two questions from the moderator and I'll look to both Ms. Temple and Mr. Gelber. Uh, do we know how many locations are eligible to I, I believe it would be the same, you know, this is outside of my area of expertise, but I believe it would be the same number that would qualify for more you know, that the town adopted a couple of years ago. Uh, and I, so I think that's the American Legion and Dover Bowl. That's correct. And not only that, it, it also is governed by the state. So there's no, they come in, they approve it, there's a process. I can't speak to the specifics of the rules. If I know that, I would have done that. But it, it is very, very closely guarded. There have been numerous articles in the newspaper about the old Seabrook dog track and how they recently approved it. And, and I know that the town of Seabrook and Bill Manzi went through a lot of deliberations <coughs> on this. Bill's the town manager, and they thought it was the right thing. And it really has sort of invigorated the dog track and helped it move along. And, and it's, it's not only that, I mean, one of the other things that they're doing is they're, they, have a, they have a poker room permit. So poker room permits are also direct fund to charity. Um, this is not, however, this has to go through the education system. But I know that initial reports on how it is done has been very favorable back in the state of New Hampshire and to the Department of Education. Additional discussion and debate on board our I want to thank all of the petitions, but especially Mr. Jobber. Um, who Mr. Jobber got a call from your moderator last night at about 5 30 p.m. Uh, because I was hoping to have somebody who would really introduce the articles so that we could have a, 
intelligent debate and discussion, and I really appreciate uh, Jim stepping forward. So I owe you a favor to you. Um, article 9. I find that the debate on Warrant Article 8 is at an end. The um, article will be placed on the ballot as published. Article 9. Resolution for fair redistricting, also by petition, to see if the town of Rollinsburg would urge that the New Hampshire General Court, which is obligated to redraw the maps of political districts within the state following the 2020 census, will do so in a manner that ensures fair and effective representation of New Hampshire residents. That in order to fulfill this obligation, the New Hampshire General Court shall appoint an independent redistricting commission that draws the new district maps in a way that does not rely on partisan data, such as election results or party registration, or favor particular parties or candidates. The record of the vote approving this article shall be transmitted by written notice from the Rollinsburg Select Board to the state legislators representing the town of Rollinsburg and to the governor of the state of New Hampshire, informing them of the instructions from their constituents within 30 days of the vote. Recommended by the Select Board, majority vote required. Um, a, a petition of Ms. Hansen will introduce Article 9 provided with the vote. Thank you, Mr. Margaret. Thank you. In here. Uh, every 10 years after the census, the state legislatures are directed to redraw political districts to take into account changes in our population. This current article was presented to try to lessen the influence of political parties and to prevent them from creating districts that are gerrymandered. The term gerrymander comes from the 1800s when Massachusetts politician Elbridge Gary defined new state Senate districts whereby he packed the Federalist Party into a few districts and allowed his own Democratic Republican Party to win the vote. At the time, a noted cartoonist of the Boston Globe showed the district to the strange, new, fabulous animal representing a salamander called a gerrymander, the name stuck, although we now call it gerrymander. This practice of the parties has gone on since and has been employed by both political parties. The winners of each election around the time of the census use this opportunity to pack and crack. This is what they call splitting districts. To, of the opposing party in packing them into districts, allowing winning parties to control the votes as much as possible in the next 10 years. Unfortunately, today with computers and the internet, the ability of any party to redistrict in its own favor is higher than ever. Districts can be grown so precisely as to consider numerous other characteristics of each potential voter, obtained by scraping the internet in order to determine which party they're likely to vote for, even if they're registered as unemployed. The result is what is referred to as wasted votes. Those are the votes that are not needed to win an election. In our handout, that was a public handout that I had in the back of the room, we give an example. If one district elects the magenta group, they can win by a narrow margin, even if there are more green groups. I was going to do the same thing on this chart, except I ran out of green, it's yellow. <laughs> so, there you go. In our, at any rate, this can happen so long as green group voters are packed into a district that elects the green group candidate by a wide margin, and the votes over and above the map required to win in that green group district are wasted. This is called packing and cracking. I'll give you an example. Exactly here, this is 50 voters. And in the, in the case that we have here, the 50 voters are, there are 20, there are 20, <coughs> there are, there are 20 voters uh, who are magenta, and in this example there are 30 voters who are in the yellow. Each of these districts that has been drawn out here is representing 10 voters. By packing and cracking, we can make it so that the magenta voters, or the pink, always win. All they have to do is they put 10 voters together, and in the top thing right here, in the top, in the top thing right here, you see 
we've got nine in the yellow and one, one pink. And this one too, nine in the yellow and one pink. But in this one, there were five pink and four, and four yellow. But you see what you're doing here is once you do this, you have a situation where you have, in these, in these two districts alone, you have 14 wasted votes. Those are the votes over and above the votes needed to have won. That's why you continually hear in some areas that there are more votes for one person than the other, but you don't have as many seats going to the person who won. The seats end up in a, in a way that you have more seats for one group than you do for the other, even though they're in the minority. This is a way that people can protect the minority for as long as they wish. This has been looked at as being very unfair, and it would be hopeful that we would try to press our general court to resolve this situation. After the last census, for instance, Stratford County was split into five senatorial districts. Many of the towns share a district with places outside of the county. For instance, two of the towns in our county share a district with Hart's location 66 miles north in Carroll County. Additionally, for instance, you're in, you're, are, we are in the Executive Council District 2. District 2 stretches from Rollinsford all the way over 100 miles to the Vermont border and then south another 40 miles to the Massachusetts border. Everything above District 2 is District 1, which is everything about the northern third or more of the state. Well, each of the districts that we have have the same number of persons in it. It makes it very hard for people, you're not really representing the same sorts of groups in any of these districts. And it's really hard for the person who's representing District 1 to drive 159 miles south to get to all of his people. And all the way across the state, I'm sure, which is about another 90 miles across, unless he's all the way up to Pittsburgh. In any event, what we're trying to do here is with all the various attempts that there have been made to try to resolve this problem over the years, the present issue is an attempt to try to fix it by having an independent commission. This independent commission is not the, the commission that we're discussing here um, is not in a specific uh, statute or, or, or anything proposed. There have been proposals made. The hope for an independent commission would be that this commission would work on the problem, resolve the problem, present it back to the general court for their approval, and perhaps we can have them be considering this without discussion of parties or, or political affiliation. If we can do it that way, every one of us can be fully represented and we will be returning to one person, one vote, which is really what we should be. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nancy. Uh, the meeting may discuss, debate, and amend the article. Discussion on uh, the board article. Uh, okay. I'm the monitor of Sims Fashion, 33 Pine Press Lane. I appreciate uh, so much being asked to speak briefly on the redistricting issue as a member of the New Hampshire League of Voters. Um, my membership actually uh, started in 1979 uh, down in Connecticut, but I stayed active as I could. Right, and an FYI, if needed, about the League, it encourages informed and active participation in all levels of government. Increased understanding of major uh, public policy issues and influences public policy for education and advocacy. Now, the redistricting, very important to know, non-partisan fairness. Fairness is fresh throughout. The commission is advocacy only and that we draw the district map line. 
the legislator still needs to approve the maps, thereby ensuring the bills are to act. A strong, vibrant, and prosperous democracy depends on voters choosing their elected leaders, not the other way around. A bipartisan sponsored uh, advisory group, independent district redistricting commission. The commission is made up of equal parts, equal numbers of Republican, Democrat, and independent grant staters to ensure that one political party is favored. And, and as so, Ms. Jensen said, following the 2010 election, a heavily gerrymandered map was introduced that favored the majority party. There is transparency in the process for redistricting. Regional public meetings held to be sure the public is very aware of each change of districts. Each county will have at least one public meeting to review the proposed changes. For any point of meeting, uh, the Secretary of State's staff will offer support. The Commission will draw the map for congressional, state legislators, executive council, and county commissions. And how the map gets approved, a plan must be uh, receive support from at least nine out of the 15 commissioners, including two members of each of the three categories of partisan affiliation. And the plan may then be voted by the state legislature. And the Hampshire voter system designed to make your voices heard instead of choosing which voices matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Additional discussion and debate on one more time. I just wanted to mention this is a non binding resolution. We just hope we can push the legislature to do what we're doing. You know, to continue their work, we're not going to tell them what to do exactly. Thank you. I find the debate on Ward Art 9 is at the conclusion, and the article will be placed on the ballot as published. Ward Art 10 pertains to the operating budget. The city of the town will vote to raise and appropriate the budget committee proposed sum of $2,454,755 for general municipal operations. This article does not include appropriations contained in special and individual articles addressed separately. Should this article be defeated, the default budget shall be $2,387,067, which is the same as last year with certain adjustments required by previous actions of the town or by law, where the governing body may hold one special meeting in accordance with RSA 41 and 13 and, and 16, take up the issue of a revised operating budget only. Note, this operating budget warrant article does not include appropriations contained in any other warrant article. Recommended by the select board, recommended by the budget committee, the jury vote required. Ms. Kendall will introduce warrant article 10 and provide a brief overview. Thank you. I just want to thank Sally Perry for um, operating the slides for us this morning and ask you to advance to the next slide. I will try to be brief as we did already have a public hearing on the town budget, uh, but I will provide you an overview with the proposal before you. There is a handout, um, it's probably the largest handout um, in the back table, which has the operating budget for your reference and it has some notes there um, on that. And again, they're on the website if we've run out of um, any of the handouts. So the appropriation summary, there is a slight decrease in revenues, but valuations are overall continuing to increase. So the proposed operating budget before you is a 2.2% 2 .2 increase over the previous year, which would indicate a 16 cent um, property tax increase relative to the previous operating budget. That being said, if all of the articles on the warrant with fiscal impact were to pass, then the overall impact to the tax rate would be level. Uh, and that is because we are proposing fewer items that affect the tax base. More items are being funded through the capital reserve funds. So I think we advance. So what is different this year from last year? 
there are um, a number of factors that inhibit the select board's ability to do what they would want to do in a budget because there are mandatory constraints, so to speak. One of those is that transfer station disposal fees um, and the, um, that the fee that we pay is increasing and also we've seen an extraordinary increase in waste disposal. The health insurance premium for the eight full-time employees of the town has increased 7.5%. At the same time, the plans that we are budgeting for those people are lesser than these plans. They're not all family plans, for example, but they are single and two family plans and not just family plans. There were a number of openings on the police department. Now that they are filled, we are budgeting for the actual plans. So that allows us a $20,000 decrease from the previous year. There are some expenses that are relative to elections, using ballots, uh, programming the ballot machine, um, lunches, um, stipends for ballot clerks, the moderator, and like that. There are four elections this year. We had one last year. So there are some changes there. Otherwise, for the most part, um, there are some um, incidental increases trying to match um, expenses to what they actually are for utilities and things like that. Some um, vendors have increased prices, so we're trying to reflect our current needs within those increased prices. Um, the other thing to note in your, in your budget proposal is that um, Team Camp is still listed. I have not, um, we haven't changed the name of that account, but there will be no Team Camp going forward this year. Instead, the Rec Committee and Select Board have decided to focus on um, attention that Camp Raleigh needs with its policies and handbooks and such. And they're going to take the funds allocated for Team Camp and propose a part-time recreation director for the year. Um, and there would still be a rec director full-time for the uh, summer while Camp Raleigh is in session, um, but to allow some um, someone to manage some certain responsibilities consistently who is a, an employee who can report to the town rather than having a completely volunteer run department. Um, so that last bullet point there, there's a savings in this proposed budget of $3,800 either in decreases or in non-increases, so to speak, because the transfer station, highway department, and fire department um, received a 50% grant um, reimbursement program through the state for LED conversion. So those, um, the expense of those was approximately 7,500 and found within the 2019 budget. Um, an additional $8,600 of 2019 funds is allocated for the town hall. So that has not yet happened. And so the funds for electrical are um, unchanged or relatively unchanged for the town hall, but there is a planned um, LED conversion for the town hall as well. If you would. So those are the small things. The big things, the big discussion points, and the bigger dollar amounts are in compensation uh, over last year. A number of department heads have expressed concern to the select board that being in the seacoast area where the unemployment rate is really low, we don't want to lose the good people that we have, which is easy to do when the unemployment rate is low and people, it's, it's the workers market, so to speak, rather than the employers market. So um, we live in one of the more expensive places of the, in the state. And the wages that we have been offering are not in line with other communities in our area. And that's difficult for sure because we are not Dover and we're not Summersworth. We don't have that kind of tax base to support really hefty salaries. But at the same time, um, the select board and department heads felt as though an effort needed to be made to retain the people that we have and do something towards those salaries. So, Within 2019, the select board um, did market adjustments for transfer station attendants and police officers not to include the police chief. Aside from that, the select board is offering um, or has included in this 
budget a 2% increase for all other full and part-time employees who are not otherwise getting addressed. So I have you know, more information about that. So the town clerk's stipend has been increased from $200 to $300 per election in this, in this year of four elections. The police chief in this proposal would receive a $5,000 market increase because his hourly wage he has exhibited to the select board is um, markedly different from other police chiefs in the area who have not served nearly as long as he has. In addition to that, I have made my own request relative to how administration works for the town. The town administrator position is new and it's evolving. We finished our first full year and I would say it's, it's going well. However, anytime townspeople come with ideas and want us to evaluate things, those things take time. Um, and, and for the select board, which is now meeting every other week, to maintain um, the ability to keep their eye on the big picture and not be quite as bogged down with daily operations, there needs to be more time in the office to look into, um, for example, elderly exemptions and what other towns do and what's fair and anything like that. So, um, I requested five additional hours for the new bookkeeper um, administrative assistant position. That position is, the person we have in that position is doing really well and has advanced qualifications. So um, I've asked for an increase for that person and also um, five additional hours. Um, the select board, in balancing all the requests from all the department heads, settled on a two and a half hour increase for that position. So that is what is reflected in that combined administrative support line and executive is the um, raise for that position. Um, so it's currently $16 an hour. I believe it's going up to $17.25. I'm sorry, I don't recall. Something like that. And then also in that line, which contains the bookkeeper administrative assistant, also um, the recording secretary for the select board um, who also helps in the office um, you know a few hours a week and myself i have requested um, the board and the budget committee have supported my request for a five thousand dollar increase to my salary bringing it from sixty thousand dollars a year to sixty five thousand dollars to reflect the fact that this position is evolving and that I will be handling more responsibilities on behalf of the board as they adopt more policies. The goal is to try to delegate some of their responsibility to me in order to allow better customer service for people who come in um, and also to allow them to do more um, planning, um, strategic planning and, and things like that. So. Um, also additional reports under my um, supervision. So, so that is the reason for that request. So many advance, thank you. Fire department salaries are very much under review. The select board and the fire department have absolutely heard the request that um, the, the, the structure of the fire department salaries is very much, as it currently stands, is very much like other on-call fire departments in the state. And, and what that means is not very um, encouraging from a fire department standpoint, which is that they are paid according to how many calls there are and how many of them respond to a call. And there's no assurance of any kind of minimum wage that they might earn um, while out on a call. And so the firefight, the Fire Department has a new software program that is allowing them to track calls better. The proposal in the Fire Department um, salary line is to increase that amount by $5,000 over what the Select Board approved in 2019. What the Select Board approved in 2019 was 5000 was their original request for 2019 that was not ultimately what was approved at the ballot box. So it is technically a $10,000 increase to the on-call salary line. That being said, 
This proposal, as currently written, removes the fire chief from the on-call salaries, and he would be paid only the stipend. The stipend, which is increasing to $15,000 in an attempt to recognize the broad range of responsibilities of that role, um, and to compensate him um, in a flat and predictable way for um, the variable amount of calls that he also responds to. And, and by removing that position completely from the call line, it allows the people who remain in that line to um, have a more um, predictably minimal level of compensation, so to speak. So that being said, it is the um, first iteration of change. The select board is committed to working with the fire department to see how this, um, how this works out with this new software to determine um, how firefighters get paid under this proposal, and it will continue to be evaluated moving forward. The highway department. Um, the highway department, you, you might have noticed, is accomplishing a whole lot, and um, it has its second full-time person, which is still um, only a couple of years old. They have requested additional staff, which the select board didn't find workable in this current budget proposal, um, and yet the select board really values the work the highway department is doing. They're able to do a lot of things in-house, which would um, be the cost of materials and in-house labor as opposed to contracting quite as much out as once used to happen. Um, we always like to include um, road projects there because it's a common question. The, the goal for this year is to finish the Woods Run project. It needs an overlay and also to um, completely recreate Sligo, the remaining portion of Sligo Road. Um, which would then receive just the binder code, um, such as the um, one that was done in 2019, that will still need a full overlay for the next couple of years. So they've done some prioritizing, with, uh, reprioritizing within their department. Um, they rented some equipment this year that was helpful for ditch work that um, our current machinery is not quite designed for. So they've reallocated funds from equipment purchased to equipment rental as well. The transfer station, as I mentioned, is one of the biggest um, causes of constraints in budget flexibility this year. It's a 30.5% overall increase. Um, again, it has to do with a slight increase in the um, tipping fee that we pay to dispose of waste. It has a lot more to do with the amount that people are throwing away. So, to some degree, this relates back to the transfer station ordinance proposed revision so that we can help to control the way in which um, people are using the transfer station. We purchased a second compactor when we renovated the transfer station a couple of years ago. That allowed us to make sure that we were hauling only very full loads of um, dumpsters, um, those compactor bins. Yet still we're finding an, an, an inordinate increase. And so there's a lot of concerns for that, which led to the select board taking advantage of a 50% grant reimbursement program to purchase scales. The goal with scales is to weigh some of the commonly disposed of bulky items such as couches and mattresses to determine what is a fair fee for those things. This may result minimally in a um, restructuring of the demolition debris schedule so that um, so that mattresses reflect, for example, what, what they really weigh. As our fee structure is now, the fees are flat and they are based visually, if, if they're not something like a mattress, they're based visually upon you know, a pickup truck load or a half pickup truck load volume as opposed to the weight, which is the measure by which we're disposing of items. So with the purchase of scales, we can try to equate what is being disposed of and its weight to the cost that we are going to pay to dispose of the same items. Our revenue from the transfer station disposal fees are 
maybe a third or a half of our waste disposal costs. And um, we're, we're, in other words, we're not recouping the expense of those items as it stands. So um, look, for, look out for change at the transfer station, um, and scales are going to help us determine a fair user fee for how people dispose of, of their things. Um, there are just, you know, we are changing the way we're doing brush chipping. That's been kind of back and forth over the past couple of years, whether we burn or whether we um, have it chipped. That's a combined approach that allows a little more flexibility um, both ways. The default budget. If the operating budget as proposed or as potentially amended does not pass the voting booth vote on March 10th, then the select board is left to manage the operations of the town within the default budget. It says there in the article what the amount of the default budget is. It's almost $68,000 less than the proposed budget. When you take into account the amount we are, we're going to have to pay the transfer station budget that we could not um, account for in the default budget, it, it really allows not a lot of flexibility if some kind of emergency were to happen. So the select board would manage the best they could within a default budget should that happen. But um, to be clear, it does not allow for any of the raises, market increases, or additional support, administrative support hours. Um, the transfer station operating costs would have to be met. Um, the increased prices for, the ven um, for vendors uh, would mean that they would have less purchasing capacity within a default budget. Um, and so again, it just it does not allow the select board as much flexibility should some kind of emergency arise. And they, they do, to be clear, have what's called bottom line authority within any operating budget, whether it's the proposed, a modified, or the default budget. The select board does um, always allocate things um, it is their job to manage the provincial affairs, and so they, they can move money around, which means that they, they may choose to reprioritize things if, in fact, they're like the default budget. All set? Thank you. For a discussion and debate on our town meeting, discuss the debate with them. So, you know, one quick question. I was wondering if the select board or the town administration has looked into um, the pay as you um, throw trash bags and the surrounding communities of the lower towns with that to help eliminate some of these shortfalls. Question to the moderator uh, regarding whether the select board is considered pay as you throw. We have a great transfer station staff now, and the transfer station manager is very much on top of how we can best manage resources for the transfer station, and that includes things like pay and throw. One of the reasons we believe that our disposal fees have increased so much is because we are um, in a region where the neighboring communities mostly or completely have pay as you throw. So as people move out of town, there's definitely an incentive to put your transfer station sticker and continue to use the transfer station, for example. So um, while that has been considered, it's not yet um, off the table, but it's, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, the scales is, is the first thing to make sure that, you know, for those disposal costs, um, we're, we're meeting those, or at least meeting the objective of, of where they should be relative to disposal costs. MSW, or municipal solid waste, um, is different. And, and the things that we have in hand that can help us bring those costs under control are to my mind, two things. One is composting. Um, ew, gross, but awesome. Um, there are commercial companies that now will work with municipalities to pick up composting um, in bags. So again, it would be a transfer station, not a composting site. But compost is um, about a third of the weight of municipal household trash. So if we can get people to compost, then we can certainly reduce the weight that we're disposing of. But at the same time, without some kind of incentive, well, you know, people might well feel, well, I pay my taxes and I don't want to recycle, that's the second thing you can do, and I don't want to compost.
post, so I'll just pay my taxes and so, so be it. Pay as you throw is the incentive. People don't want to pay for bags, and people with this added expense would, would try to, um, it curbs consumer behavior, so they are more likely to um, maximize composting and recycling than they would otherwise. So um, while it's been talked about and considered, we're not there yet. There's a lot to learn and think about and consider before we adopt such a food. But look out for it. So I'd like to ask the board uh, what steps they've taken um, to put performance review in place for town employees and how they determine um, the increases for um, the executive office. Um, all of the departments actually, because those are where the most of the board are, including the fire department. I have a question for the moderator for the regarding performance review and process for determining uh, proposed wage for salary increases. I'll take the first stab at this, but the select board may want to weigh in. The police, up until 2019, the police department was the only department that had the benefit of a direct supervisor and enough administrative support that there was a consistent annual performance evaluation. Since the town administrator position has been created, it is my goal to absolutely do performance reviews for those people who report to me. Um, there are still department heads, you know, for, for the department heads, they, they report to the select board. The select board are essentially volunteers who work full time and they change. So it's really hard to say until and unless all of the department heads report to the town administrator, it's really hard to promise or say that the select board will, you know, guarantee performance reviews for department heads. And so it creates a little bit of inequity um, within town employment when some people can benefit from merit increases or the opportunity for merit increases because they have a supervisor who's done a performance review as opposed to somebody else who doesn't necessarily have that opportunity because the select board either doesn't have the time, doesn't know how to, or just chooses for whatever reason not to. So um, we're getting better is all I can say about that. So three years, um, probably five, the five weeks of one budget for me is my top of this. You know, we need a way more uh, equitably distributed of these raises. Um, instead of just across the board raises. Um, and so nothing's really changed in five years. Um, and it's unfortunate because we continue to ask our taxpayers to just blindly pay and sell the tax bills. And you know, we have a way of determining you know, what's changed, you know, what's changed about our services. Um, so uh, with that being said, Thank 
Administrator, I think finally brings us into the 20th century. Uh, I, I have said for years that I just don't believe we are keeping up uh, in our compensation of employees. We expect a lot. Uh, and then we're all at, at a meeting and we're discussing uh, cutting uh, raises, cutting increases. Uh, but I've seen some of these salaries and unfortunately they're not very much to begin with. Uh, I think we need to do a much better job keeping people in this town, uh, keeping the, the folks that are basically the blood running through the veins of this town. Um, and I think uh, part of what the town administrator was talking about, uh, some revamping responsibilities, some additional responsibilities, I don't think we're taking these things into account. Um, you know, we, we're, we're very uh, conscious of us. As a member of the school board, I know that we, we look at the budget very closely because we are aware of what folks uh, are paying in tax. And uh, I don't think trying to keep employees working for our town is a bad thing. I think we need to, it, it's, we ask for certain things to be done, and they get done. But then at the end of the year, when we, we go through this all the time. We're always fighting on compensation of our, our employees. Uh, I, I just, I really don't understand it. Uh, it it's, it's, it's frustrating. And I realize too that, you know, there are changes that are going on, you know, as the responsibilities we talked about, uh, the town administration, uh, administrator spoke of. So do we expect that folks are just going to continue to do more different work and we're not going to take into account that when, when it comes time to uh, talk about salaries? I, I, I'm absolutely against this. I think it sends a bad signal. Um, why would anybody want to work in a town where they just don't want the town just doesn't want to pay? Thank you. Further discussion, debate on the proposed amendment to board our report of information. Ms. Stewart. This is Andy with the Board County. I'm a little confused because I think the amendment was both to the operating budget and the capital budget, and I don't believe that that is appropriate. I think we're only talking about the operating budget. So you think that this body does not have the authority to modify the capital budget? I thought it was a button that they could, they could affect this the is the bar board on the operating budget only, which has a different figure from what is there. So it does the proposed amendment does it, it is is directed to the bottom line of that the bottom line of the, of the entire appropriation. What we're talking about is the Warren article on the, on the on the operating budget, which has a different bottom line than the, than the amount. That's being referenced on the on the warrant, I believe. That's why I'm asking the question. So the uh, point of information asks about the permissibility of the proposed amendment, and um, Ms. Saint Hilaire, would you accept the friendly amendment to say um, the budget for general municipal operations? And that would clarify that she's proposing to affect general municipal operations, which is what is in Article. That would have a different, you know, a different total of uh, I am going to ask you the same. Uh, looks like, are you withdrawing the proposed amendment you're going to resubmit? Okay. So the proposed amendment has been withdrawn. We are in general debate on Article 10. I'm going to give Ms. Angel here a chance to redraft. Is there other debate and comment on the Warren Article 10? Oh, sorry. Well, while that's going on, I just want to clarify um, that nothing's happened in the last five years with the Budget Committee in the request for performance evaluations. That in 2020, as a result of in 2020, as a result of the changes in administration, 
six people would receive a performance review that wouldn't have before. So, like I said, we're making progress, and that is a new change as a result of, of new responsibilities. So, like I said, it is getting better. The six additional people who would not have previously received a performance review will now disappear. Very general discussion on our intent. Yes, sir. Yes, I want seven people to do that work. Um, that's my general comment. I mean, yes, we've been asking for a while for a performance review, and it just seems kind of on its face. Uh, you don't have performance reviews for your people for based on races and stuff. And it, it could be unfair. I, I understand the things, but it, it could be unfair. You don't. It, it just seems that, I don't know how you begin to raise this when you don't know the performance of your personnel. Most state, most government agencies, and always have performance with these great people, so you know how to work them put it. doesn't seem like it's that unfair of a request, especially if you've been asked for over five years now to come up with a plan and maybe make some kind of commitment to a date as to when you may have some type of performance review. Uh, it would be uh, much better 
to leave the ten thousand dollars. I am not in favor of this amendment to leave the ten thousand dollars in the budget and, and continue to ask that that uh, the, the you know, oversight continue at a pace that's reasonable. Thank you. For a discussion to be on post amendment for an article. Right here, it's in Washington. I too am in opposition to lowering the budget by ten thousand dollars. And the reason for that is we've had numerous meetings with the select board and the budget committee who's reviewed this. The select board and the board of the department heads, the select board has done a lot of work in preparing the budget. Furthermore, they had meetings with the budget committee, and the budget committee has voted in favor. I think everybody's looked at this pretty carefully. And I think that the fact that the uh, select board and the executive branch of the government is making progress on the idea of performance reviews, I think that's enough for us to, to approve the budget as it is originally submitted and not have an amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the proposal? Mr. Coons? Tom Coons, sir. I just wanted to say that also um, opposed to this this amendment. You know, we, we have folks that we elect to the select board we hire folks to do a job. Uh, you know, when they're making a recommendation for an increase for the employees, I, I guess it looks to us like we're second guessing them. I, I don't think they would come forward with recommended increases if they didn't feel it was warranted. Uh, but we're asking them to do a job, and part of that is uh, making sure their employees are doing the right thing. And if they're coming to us with a recommended compensation, uh, I just don't know why we're I'll recognize the speaker to come forward and I'll ask tellers uh, to get the game getting into this issue. Jason Sargent, Stock Show Sir. Uh, from what I understand of the proposed amendment, we're going to decrease, decrease the entire operating budget by ten thousand dollars. If I take a look at this fact sheet that was in the back of the room, it doesn't look like we've spent our entire budget for the last number of years. And uh, I know there was a slide that discussed that uh, Really, what we're doing is we're just going to take ten thousand dollars away from a buffer or a search capacity that the select board could use should they need to expand the funds. They are allowed to debit or credit any particular line item here, so it's really only a suggestion that we're looking at um, wages and salaries of talent or uh, personnel. But I don't really see this as changing any overall aspect of how the budget is going to be spent this year, um, particularly because. We haven't spent, uh, looks like we have at least uh, more than $100,000 margin in expenditures and budgets for the past number of years. So, uh, just open discussion. I, I don't have a comment on our forward test. Thank you, Mr. Surgeon. So, um, tellers. Keep that number in your mind. 
find out if the total town was manned. Those opposed to proposed article, oh, the proposed amendment, please raise your card and hold it up.
people's ability to walk to the school. So um, other than that, we have not determined specific sidewalks. Thank you. This meeting may discuss the debate in the more. Um, so well, I'm wondering if this is uh, an article that will be um, reoccurring in the future, or if this is just a one-time article. So a question to the moderator, is this a recurring like this article is funded through that capital reserve fund. That's probably the last time that's going to happen for a few years just because um, it, we only get about twelve or $13,000 a year into that fund from the $5 fee from registrations. Um, that's, that's where those funds come from. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the end of sidewalk repair. That would happen going forward within the operating budget under um, road maintenance. Is there further discussion and debate on Article 12? I find that the debate on Article 12 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article 13, please please your payment to see if the town will vote to raise the appropriate $13,000 for the second year lease payment for the police cruiser. Further to authorize the withdrawal of $13,000 from the capital approval plan, capital reserve fund. No amount to come from taxation recommended by the select board, recommended by the budget committee to the majority of the required. This kind of thing would be introduced. So I think it's pretty self explanatory. It's the second um, payment for the cruiser that we purchased in 2019. We just took delivery of that vehicle. So um, when that is completely equipped, we'll put the old one out to bid. It's from Capital Reserve Fund, so there's no taxation. We are required to ask for this every year that there is a payment. So um, there are three year leases. Discussion and debate on board Article 13. I find that debate on Article 13 is over. The article will be placed on the ballot. Article 14, police cruiser lease, to see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to enter into a three year lease agreement in the amount of $26,000 for the purpose of leasing a police cruiser and to raise and appropriate the sum of $13,000 for the first year's payment for that purpose. Further, to raise and appropriate an additional $13,000 to equip the vehicle and further to authorize the withdrawal of $25,000 from the capital improvement reserve fund established for this purpose. This lease agreement does not contain an escape clause. $1,000 to come from taxation, recommended by the select board, recommended by the budget committee, two third majority vote required. This can be the article. We purchased the vehicle, as I just said, in 2019. We're proposing to do so again in 2020, which is off cycle. We historically purchased cruisers every other year. A few years ago, one cruiser was in an accident and not replaced, and that resulted in um, higher mileage on the remaining cruiser. So the goal with this purchase, uh, this off-cycle cruiser purchase, is to reduce the mileage overall to the fleet. Thank you. Is there a discussion and debate on more than the fleet? Since there is no escape clause in the um, a lease agreement, what happens if this does not pass in the future? If we're left with a $13,000 Payment fee. Is that absorbed by the tax base um, in the budget? So, question to the moderator regarding the impact of the no escape clause. So, this cruiser will have an article supporting it. It's it's lease payment, much like Article 13 that you saw before it. So, Article 13, if it does not pass, uh, that cruiser payment would have to come from the operating budget. Um, otherwise, we would have to figure out a way to sell it, um, but there is no state clause, so I'm, I'm not sure that's possible. The short answer is the pay would come from the operating budget somehow, but it's not a budget expense in the operating budget. Thank you. For the discussion of the paper, I'm going to find that the article, the, the debate on Article 14 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article 15 relates to the emergency extrication equipment for the Rollinsburg Fire Department. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $30,000 for purchasing emergency extrication equipment for the fire department, and further to authorize the withdrawal of $30,000 from the capital including reserve fund established for this purpose, no amount to come from taxation. 
recommended by the select board, recommended by the budget committee, majority board required. Ms. Kendall will introduce Ward Art 15, please be The extrication equipment is commonly referred to as the jaws of life. The fire department currently owns this equipment. It's hydraulic and it's really old and they cannot find parts. They're not really repairable anymore. Um, the new equipment proposed to be purchased is actually three separate pieces of equipment, um, approximately $10,000 each. They are now stronger and battery operated. Thank you. Is there, this meeting can discuss debate and then the article is the discussion of debate on the article 15. Any questions? I find the debate on Ward Article 15 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. On Article 16, Fire Forestry Vehicles, to see if the town will raise and appropriate the sum of $55,000 to replace the forestry vehicle for the fire department. And further, to authorize the withdrawal of $55,000 from the Capital Improvement Reserve Fund established for this purpose. No amount of company taxation recommended by the Select Board, recommended by the Budget Committee, and the majority of the this purchase was not verbally proposed at the um, public hearing for the town budget. And for that, I want to apologize to the voters and the fire department. It was part of the what was the draft warrant at that time. It was the goal to always present this in its own slide. It was, however, listed as an item in the bottom of the operating budget handout that was available on that day, which is similar to the one you're looking at today. So, um, we, we, our goal is always, of course, to follow the law, and procedure matters, and um, the rights of the residents, of course, matter. And so, um, the loss to the public in this era is that people were not allowed the opportunity um, more visibly to um, discuss the article and um, tell the budget committee how they felt about the article before the budget committee recommended it. Um, we discovered that error immediately following the public hearing and brought that um, to the attention of the budget committee who chose to recommend the article anyway should we discover that it is possible to continue with its proposal. So we entered into conversation with the Department of Revenue who reminded us of the RSA which states that it has to be disclosed or discussed. And while it was certainly disclosed, um, it could have been discussed more. Um, and it, you know, people had the right to bring it forward um, because it was visibly there in the operating budget. And um, that's less than wonderful, I'll be the first to admit, but it does meet the minimum standard that it was disclosed. And so, for that reason, we are proposing to replace the forestry vehicle, which is 17 years old and continuing to experience um, additional repairs needed in place. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. For discussion and debate on the Article 16. Carrie Boyle, 150 Corner Road. Um, it, this has nothing to do with whether I am for or against this warning article. It was about the process. Because um, although it did, it did appear in the handout, um, unless everyone was following exactly through the handout, it did not, the warning article did not appear on the presentation. Um, and when the um, public hearing had ended, most of the people left, and that's when the budget committee discussed it. So a lot of people didn't even know about this. So I, I just think procedurally this is wrong. Thank you, Ms. Bork. Further discussion and debate on the warrant article 16. I find the debate on article 16 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Uh, assuming that the findings, I'm not sure if there are additional findings that are necessary, but it sounds like the Senate board is addressing the other procedural areas. I do have the, the wording from the DRA. Um, if I could just read that in here. Okay. 
um, all purposes and amounts of appropriations to be included in the budget or special warrant articles shall be disposed or discussed at the final hearing. The governing body or budget committee shall not thereafter insert in any budget column or special warrant article an additional amount or purpose of appropriation what was not disclosed or discussed at the hearing without first holding one or more public hearings on supplemental budget requests for town and district expenditures. Um, sorry, and I just have one more thing to say is, um, so I'm actually surprised that the budget committee took a vote on this without the public hearing. Because when I sat on the budget committee, um, Suzanne, um, actually Suzanne and I, Suzanne Hewitt and I had a conversation about public hearings. And at one of the meetings we sat here and Suzanne had said to me that the budget committee needs to hear what people in attendance at the public hearing have to say, this is generally what the conversation was, before the budget committee makes their decision. So there was no discussion about this at the public hearing. And then the budget committee made their recommendation to support it without hearing from anyone. Thank you, Ms. Board. Um, I, I think I think we can all agree that this was not necessarily the optimum approach, and that it, it you know if it could have it could have happened differently, it would have. It was an error. However, at least two or three times in reading the RSA, um, Carrie said to so if you could dis address the article rather than an individual member of the body. Thank you. To dis the, the statute says to disclose or discuss, or disclose or discuss. The disclosure was the fact that it was on all of the printed materials that outlined the budget. So it had been disclosed. It was not discussed during that public hearing. Agreed. As far as the budget committee, <clears throat> I'm not speaking for the budget committee, I'm just a member, but we did uh, talk about this and said, well, it, we will recommend it and hope if, in fact, the DRA says that the process was appropriate. And we did meet the minimum level of appropriateness because it was disclosed. I think we did it well again. Then I show sure hope when people come to the public hearings next year, they go through, they look at those handouts closely. Because I'm not saying that it could, you know, is going to happen, but you know, if you can just put something, you know, stick something in there and and then say, well, it was disclosed. We didn't discuss it, we didn't put it on the screen, but we disclosed it, we put it in there. I think it's a slippery slope. So um, I know that there was a warrant article submitted for a zoning, uh, zoning and planning board, um, and it, it missed the deadline, and I understand that. So, but I'm thinking, you know, it works both ways. We can't, you know, make exceptions for some things over here and not on the other. So I think both, you know, the public and the town needs to play by the same rules. So. Thank you, Ms. Board. Finally, the Mr. Fox, you can identify yourself as a Thank you, Mr. Martin. Something for our phone. The question is, really, is it right to go ahead? Not right to go ahead? I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure. I certainly don't know. Let's see your question. So question should we go ahead with this? Legally. So, Mr. Foss, I think that's a question for the planning board. Um, even though I am a member of that learned profession, I'm not providing legal counsel for the town of Rollinsburg. It would be a mistake for me to do so. Um, so, uh, if, the plan if the select board has a response, I think it can consider the sense of the body here um, in regard to whether or not they can't put it on the ballot. But I don't think it's a decision that this deliberative session can make. I, I would 
would just comment that it's a it's a legal decision, really. And legal decisions are always open to um, attorney and court um, interpretation of the law that was well um, rightly read. So um, the select board took the same um, view that Suzanne Hewitt did um, that the minimum standard was met. And while it was certainly not optimal, and they do, we all apologize for how this all happened, it does meet the minimum standard of disclosed or discussed. Mr. Tom Coons, uh, Stockdale Circle. Um, if the minimum standard was met, and, and I think the town administrator and uh, the members of the select board have indicated that perhaps could have been done a little bit differently. If the minimum, minimum standard has been met, and it can be going forward as a, a, a warrant, I, I would be up to the town. Either way, apparently we need a uh, fire force from here. So the alternative would be that we're going to remove this and then end up having to go through this again next year. So I'm not sure I see the, the benefit of that. Thank you. Mr. Coates? 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 Mr. Co
Thank you. Sorry. The current generator is old. Um, it is propane. It cannot be replaced as propane with the current layout. Um, they are evaluating whether or not it would be propane or diesel going forward. It serves the town hall and police station. I'm not sure what the age of the current generator is, but it is failing. It's difficult to find parts. It would only the, the replacement would only happen if necessary. Thank you. Thank you.
quantum of the balance would be that you would be here. So I think there's a, uh, Ms. Kendall was getting an answer to the previous question and then we'll probably get this the next question. I calculate the tax impact at approximately 65 cents, and the balance of all the reserve funds is on a yellow handout, um, rather, sorry, green, on the back table. If that is missing, it is on the website where I will make copies for anyone who wishes. Um, I do not have that sheet in front of me, so I can't speak to that. Nobody here is wearing their glasses. It looks like the balance is currently $347,400. Further discussion and debate on Article 19. The final debate on Article 19 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Part 20 relates to changing the fire chief from elected to appointed. It states to see if the town will vote to change the position of fire chief from an elected position to an appointed position pursuant to RSA 154.1b and further to authorize the select board to appoint the fire chief annually. If approved, the fire chief will be elected in September meeting of 2021. Recommended by the select board, which are both required, Ms. Campbell will not provide a reconstruction. This one's pretty self-explanatory. The goal is not to um, usurp the fire chief position in any way. Um, there's no goal to change the person that currently fills that position necessarily. The goal is to incorporate that, that department more into the regular operations of the town and to make that, um, the, that department head operate the way other department heads and departments operate. This meeting can discuss debate and maybe you know, the other. So, um, so my question is, at this point, the way it stands, anybody with a background in fire or any resident could apply for this position and be put on the ballot. What is the um, select board going to do to invest in the future uh, appropriate people for this position? Question to the moderator regarding qualifications for the position. To, to be clear, there are no current qualifications. One only needs to be a resident to get on the ballot, and that is part of the concern of the select board is that anybody who is capable of winning that election need not really have any fire service training or expertise, and so this would also remedy that. Um, aside from that, the fire chief position is pretty well outlined in the state statute, and so um, if there was a reason to be considering new applicants for this position, then the select board would um, interview that person according to those qualification standards. Thank you. Further discussion and debate on Article 20. We'll see how this So currently, um, the fire chief must be a resident of the town. By making this change, would it then give the select board the opportunity to choose somebody who is not a resident? Question for the moderator regarding the uh, service and qualifications. The select board has been discussing that, but hasn't really made a determination on that specifically. I would just say that it would be important for the fire chief to at least live nearby so that they could respond um, within a certain time frame. But that does not, does not necessarily require residency, but like I said, they have not really decided that. Further discussion and debate on that. Mr. Fox. Thank you, Ross. I'm really against this. Anytime you lose your ability to vote on something, is, uh, I think is bad. And it's really insulting. You don't my goal to vote. I've lived here for 45 years and my people voted for the fire chief. And we've had more than one person to vote for for all the years. And I thought people have done a good job. So what makes you think that you, the board, is better at it than all the people in town? Hmm, we've done a good job. So if you're going to take this away, what's coming next on the vote? And anything that deals with voting, you know, leave it. 
understand where I'm coming from because <clears throat> I actually should not be taking away my right to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Potts. Any further debate or discussion on Article 20? May I come on that? I think in the interest of moving things along, I, I don't think we need to go take for chat on every comment. And I, I think Mr. Foss was making a comment rather than asking a question. All right. Uh, I find the debate on Article 20 is over, and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article 21 is the Town Evaluation Capital Reserve Fund to see if the town will vote for raising appropriate sum of $18,750 to be added to the Town Evaluation Capital Reserve Fund established for this purpose from taxation recommended by the Select Board, recommended by the Budget Committee, majority vote required, and is under the main reconstruction. This, this allows a savings opportunity, a savings account, so to speak. We are required by the Department of Revenue to reevaluate all the property in town once every five years, rather than have a spike in the tax rate every five years. This puts money away so that it is a level of impact on the tax rate. This meeting can discuss the debate again, I find the debate on Article 21 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article 22 relates to the Culver Repair Replacement Reserve Fund to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate $10,000 to be added to the Culver Repair Replacement Reserve Fund established for this purpose from taxation, recommended by the Select Board, recommended by the Budget Committee, majority vote required, and it's pending will continue to introduce the article to us. This is a more recent standard annual request. Um, the town does not have a comprehensive list and um, evaluation of the status of all the culverts in town. We are aware of a culvert problem on um, in the Foundry Locust Street area. We are going to work to assess that situation this year, which will require engineering and um, any time we, all of these kinds of repairs, as we saw from the emergency repair of Partridge Lane four or so years ago, um, they, they're tens of thousands of dollars. So this, this um, article accomplishes, it, it helps us put things aside for the unknowable, but they will also help us to determine what's going on in that one area. Thank you very much. For this meeting to discuss debate and then the article, Ms. Diane. Nancy Dam, 44 Rollins Road. Can you please tell us how much is in the public reserve fund at this time? The question to the moderator regarding the current balance of the fund. It is $40,579. And a follow up. Do you have any plans other than Foundry Street of any other colleges that you're looking at to fix? Question to the moderator regarding other plans besides the Foundry Street. No, the goal otherwise is to be prepared for some kind of emergency such as Partridge Lane, which cost us about $85,000. Further discussion and debate on Article 22. I find the debate on Article 22 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Article 23 relates to Conservation Land Trust Capital Reserve Fund to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate sum of $15,000 to be added to the Conservation Land Trust Capital Reserve Fund. $10,000 will be transferred from Land Use Change Tax Fund to fund this appropriation no amount to come from taxation. Did I read that correctly? We did. Um, recommended by the Select Board, recommended by the Budget Committee, majority vote required. And this will provide a brief introduction. Up until this year, this was a $10,000 annual request. Um, the Conservation Commission had requested from the Select Board to make it $25,000, and the Select Board settled on proposing the $15,000 amount. This fund it makes available um, monies to the town should the town want to purchase a property for conservation. It became more of a discussion item recently when the 58 acres on Bear Road came up for sale. There are a number of other parcels in town which are quite large. So it's a value statement about the cost of development on, on a community. Um, development requires infrastructure and um, 
is, is always more of a burden on the tax base than an undeveloped land. And we appreciate the rural nature of Rollinsford. It's just about how much money to set aside to um, maintain what the voters think is appropriate.
Article 24 relates to land surveys and related expenses to see if the town will vote to raise the appropriated sum of $5,000 to finance land surveys and related expenses that may be incurred in assisting private landowners who donate conservation easements and or to purchase options to buy critical lands that the town wish to protect open space, open space for conservation uses. And further to authorize the withdrawal of $5,000 from the Conservation Land Trust Capital Reserve Fund for this purpose. No amount of country taxation recommended by the Select Board and by the Budget Committee, which already vote required, is come with the reasonable reproduction. This allows the town the flexibility to help somebody who may not have the resources um, to donate or sell their land to the town for conservation. It helps to pay for our surveying expenses and other related costs um, should somebody want to do that. Um, it is only if there, somebody comes forward for that purpose. This meeting may discuss a debate and amend the articles. I find the debate on Article 24 is over. The article will be placed on the ballot. Article 25, authority to sell surplus equipment and vehicles. Uh, to see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to sell to the highest bidder the surplus equipment and vehicles owned by the town. Recommended by the select board, the majority vote required. This annual reconstruction is It's pretty self explanatory and it is an annual article. Um, I'll just say the only equipment on hand that I anticipate we would get rid of in 2020 is a police cruiser and the forest fire, the fire forestry vehicle um, if they are recent. Um, I thought we were getting to the police vehicles and has one already been gotten rid of um, or not. Question to the moderator regarding the status of uh, surplus vehicles. What one police cruiser is currently almost available to be put out to bid. Um, the, there may be a second one that um, could be available by the end of the year. It depends on when this new cruiser is put into service. I was going to say before it's going to be able to be put into service. So, um, the answer to your question. Any discussion and debate on Article 25? And the debate on Article 25 is over and the article will be placed on the ballot. Ms. Matthews has uh, a, an announcement under Article 26. While she's approaching the microphone, uh, I want to thank uh, Kate. Nesbitt, uh, Caroline Kendall, the select board on the boardway of the supervisor's checklist, Chief Ducharme, uh, and his uh, staff for their help getting ready for this meeting. I also want to thank the fellows who assisted on both things. Uh, under other business that may need to come before the meeting, Ms. Matthews has an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just wanted to remind everyone who's remaining here who might be living in the Rollins for Border Sewer District. The annual meeting will be on March 17th at 6.30 p.m. at the uh, Legion Hall, and doors open at 6 p.m. for voter and resident check-in with the supervisors. Also, if you're running for any offices in town, I am going to be doing interviews again this year. For anyone who's interested in being interviewed and being more visible with the electorate, with Tamara and Rachel Kelsey and I will be doing that on uh, February 22nd to Saturday all day. So just check in with me after this if you're interested in uh, having some fun with uh, getting yourself more out there in the Thank you. Yeah. If there's no other business, I'll accept a motion to dismiss. But before I do that, uh, if anybody uh, wishes to help save the town with some trees, I'll turn their tarps and supervisors that will trade it. People can help them. Um, Chairs to the side that would be helpful too. I would accept the motion to dismiss this meeting. Mr. Dyer, is there a second? Yes, Ms. Almighty. Those in favor say aye. Why didn't you, aye. Why didn't you speak up and ask for total? Okay.